Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video examines Chapter 5, Sections 33 and 34 of Heidegger's Being in Time. I'll be addressing the following questions. 1. What is a statement? 2. Why is the statement a derivative mode of interpretation? And 3. How is discourse an existential of Dasein? Before moving ahead with the last two sections of Part A, Chapter 5, let's briefly review what we have covered in the last two videos. We addressed two echi primordial existentials that disclose Dasein's being there in a world. Those two are attunement and understanding. Attunement entails the way Dasein is affected by its world. It's the state or mood in which one finds oneself. Understanding is a mode of projecting oneself in a manner that discloses one's possibilities and is made explicit through interpretation. The possibility of interpretation belongs to both existentials, since even attunement maintains itself in a particular understanding. To briefly define interpretation, it's the appropriation of what is understood and is characterized by its as structure, such as when interpreting the hammer as a hammer, the cat as a cat, etc. These interpretations are themselves preceded by a certain force structure that must be in place for such interpretations to happen in the first place. Herein forms the basis for the hermeneutical circle. With that, we can now more fully appreciate what Heidegger means in section 33 concerning the notion of the statement or assertion. Heidegger appears to equate the statement with propositional judgments. Without suggesting that this is the only way these words are defined, we can understand propositions to be the basic units of logical analysis and judgments to be the assertion of truth or falsity that is contained within those propositions. These propositional judgments or statements have often been conferred the status of what is most fundamental for philosophy, which was especially the case in those philosophies to have emerged from Frege, Russell, and the early Wittgenstein. Heidegger provides three meanings of the statement. All of them are intended to show that, despite how they're typically understood, the statement is, in fact, intimately connected with the problem of being. First, he indicates that the statement is a pointing out. It illuminates a thing in such a way as to let a particular being be seen in some manner. Heidegger uses the statement, the hammer is heavy, throughout this section. In this statement, the pointing out is not an abstract representation of the object present to hand, but instead it's a manner of speaking about the hammer as it's being used. Second, the statement is made equivalent to predication. A predicate is that part of a sentence that makes a determination of the subject. Predication offers a narrower means of shedding light on the being of something, a pointing out that focuses on particular characteristics of the being and limiting what shows itself to manifest only that dimension being predicated. Third, the statement is a mode of communication. So when pointing out through predication, it's done with the purpose of letting another see along with me that definitive character of that being. So the statement can be encapsulated by saying that it's a pointing out which communicates and defines. The conclusion from the three meanings of the statement is that it's not first a joining together of an abstract concept of, for example, hammerness with another abstract concept, that of heaviness. Instead, the statement more primordially emerges out of the hammers ready to hand, while I am a being in the world, being there with others. As such, the statement is a mode of interpretation as it's performed based on what is already disclosed in understanding through a force structure. Nonetheless, the statement is a derivative mode of understanding, and so we must next understand how this is the case. Despite being grounded in a more primordial situation, the statement itself represents a shift in the mode of interpretation, moving from a hermeneutical as to an apophantical as. The Greek term apophantic is associated with Aristotle, who used it to refer to a statement that makes a judgment concerning the truth or falsity of something. 
As such, the apophantical as can be understood as a mode of interpretation that concerns itself with theoretical statements that are a step removed from how these beings appear as ready to hand, shifting our vision to view these beings as instead present at hand. So a statement such as, it is true that that hammer is heavy, is an apophantical as. It transforms the at hand to the about which. Herein, for Foresight aims at what is objectively present while its handiness becomes covered over and veiled. Also, there's no longer a reaching out into the totality of relevance when approaching what is understood. Instead, one is cut off from the surrounding world as pointing out becomes a mere looking at. When this derivative form of interpretation is mistaken as primordial, then fundamental ontology itself is once again forgotten. One may also liken this to how the empirical sciences operate. The empirical sciences, though themselves are not primarily based on pure logic, they do require a certain kind of logical structure to make sense of the empirical findings. And in order to make a logically sound statement in science, one has to suspend, in a sense, all that which does not conform to the scientific method and its procedures, such as the process of operationalization, which allows the variable to be measurable and to exclude all that which is not measurable, including all the surrounding world that makes that variable meaningful in the first place. So in contrast to this apophantical as, the Explicit or implicit understanding of the hammer as used for hammering is in reference to the hermeneutical as. The hermeneutical as is grounded upon the being's readiness to hand and so offers a more primordial mode of interpretation than the apophantical as. As such, the truth is not first a true proposition, but finds its primary grounding in existence. Section 34 picks up with the third meaning of the statement, which is that it's a mode of communication. This mode of speaking forth raises a third existential alongside of attunement and understanding. That third existential is discourse, or what is also translated as talk. Discourse expresses itself through language, and language is something that appears first as ready to hand. Through the use of language, discourse forms the basis of both interpretation and the statement. It's how the intelligibility of the there is articulated. So discourse is another manner by which Dasein and its being in the world is disclosed. Discourse includes several characteristics that make language ontological possible. One of those characteristics is communication. Communication entails discourse as it's being expressed in one's being with others. It includes making statements and giving information, but also assenting, refusing, warning, talking things through, etc. Notably, communication is not a conveying of experience from within my subjective sphere to the internal subjective sphere of another. And this is because discourse is primordially always already outside us when it understands. It's expressed first and foremost through being in the world and how I appropriate understandings from that world to form interpretations of the things within it. And when I communicate this to another, what I'm making known through discourse are the manners and modes by which I'm in this world and how I'm uniquely attuned with it. So I'm not communicating an internal mental state or mental contents, but I'm in fact disclosing the truth of my ontological situation that's always already out there in the world. Now, discourse does not necessarily entail merely speaking, but first actually entails listening and keeping silent. Listening to forms another characteristic of discourse. It concerns my existential being open to the other and my being with them. It's also an openness to Dasein's own most possibilities of being, which will become more evident once we take up the notion of the call of conscience, a kind of hearing that understands 
understands what is being listened to, Heidegger calls hearkening. Hearkening discloses how we never first experience pure sensory information before arriving at an understanding of it. We don't first hear noises and sounds as mere noises and sounds, but instead hear them as cars, baby, the baby's cries, the tapping of my keyboard. Dasein always already finds itself in a world, meaning that I can only encounter inner worldly things through the force structure of my understanding. Consequently, there's no pure sensory experience devoid of understanding. Even when I'm unable to decipher what something means, such as, for example, when I'm being being exposed to a foreign language. It's only in relation to what I do understand that what I'm now hearing becomes understood as something that I don't understand. Along with listening, there's the essential possibility in discourse of keeping silent. Perhaps you might imagine those individuals who just talk, 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 and who never seem to listen and can't keep silent. And when they do keep silent, it's only because they're thinking about what they want to say next rather than any kind of hearkening of the other's message. So speaking a lot can sometimes be an obstacle to understanding rather than merely being a means toward it. However, keeping silent also isn't the same as keeping mute. Keeping silent is a mode of authenticity in which Dasein has something to say and the capacity to disclose itself through discourse, but exhibits reticence in communicating it for the sake of the genuine possibility of hearing and being with another in a transparent mode. In the next video, we'll discuss an inauthentic mode of discourse that Heidegger calls idle talk. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching and until next time, be well.